Thank you so much, Scott. Thank you all. It's a, a joy, a blessing to be here. Um, I think it's okay to walk, isn't, are you supposed to walk through Mary to Jesus? Is, I think that's how it works. So that, that's how I took it. So uh, this is, I love this theme. Uh, although I have to say I was duped when I was first invited, I thought this was all about encountering Jesus in the desert. <laughs> and I came and there's just been lots of fasting. I don't know what's happening here. No, it's gonna <laughs> oh, this is... Uh, so great to see everyone back together uh, here like this. This is, a, this is amazing. Uh, after, after being a year off from many conferences and pilgrimages, it's so fun to see people gathering back at church, gathering back for conferences. I just led a pilgrimage to Rome last month again, and it just feels like, okay, we're starting to get back to normal. Uh, but it's been a challenging year for all of us, and I'm excited to get into this theme of into his likeness, the idea of how can we be transformed, not just in the good times, but even in the desert. And that's what I want to do here. So speaking of pilgrimages, how many of you have been to the Holy Land? Anyone been to the Holy Land? Okay, th who wants to go to the Holy Land? All right, I'm going to take you there this morning. We're going to go there this morning, at least in our imagination. Are you ready? I, I want to take you to one of my favorite spots when I lead pilgrimages to, to Israel. One of the first places I go is up on the northern part of the Sea of Galilee. And it's where a, a dramatic scene took place, a conversation between Jesus and Peter. Jesus and Peter. And Jesus asks Peter a very personal question. He says this, do you love me? Do you love me? Now, at first glance, that should be like a no-brainer. That's, that's, you know, this should be, of course, Peter loves Jesus. This is Peter, the guy that dropped the fishing nets behind and followed Jesus as a disciple for three years. Of course he loves Jesus. This is Jesus, the Peter who, who was made the rock upon which Jesus was going to build his church. Of course, Peter loves Jesus. But if you read this in John's Gospel, Pope Benedict once reflected on this, that the, the particular Greek word that's used here for love w would make Peter pause. You see, the word that's used here is uh, agapao, based on agape love, which is this total sacrificial love, the love that Jesus modeled for us on the cross. Jesus doesn't use, in John's presentation of this, he doesn't use uh, another word, like philia, love, which is just basic, ordinary human friendship. That's not the word Jesus uses. He uses this higher level of love, total, unconditional, perfect, self-giving love. Now, even that word, I got I to gotta tell you, if you're, if you're reading the Gospels and you look at Peter's life, I think earlier in Peter's career, Peter probably would have just jumped at that. He would have said, oh yeah, of course, Jesus, yeah, I love you with agape love. But something happened a few days ago before this scene. On Holy Thursday night, Peter, we know, denied Jesus three times. And here is, this is Easter now. Jesus is risen from the dead. It's after the resurrection. And this is the first biblical account we have of a one-on-one, one-on-one conversation between Peter and Jesus. So just picture this. You're Peter. Put yourself in his shoes. You know what you did on Holy Thursday night. You know you failed miserably. You completely dropped the ball. You denied your Lord. And Jesus is risen. Everyone's all excited. They're jumping up and down. But then all of a sudden, you know, things are settling down. And Peter looks you in the eye and says, Hey, Pete, let's have a chat. <laughs> what are you thinking? Uh-oh. <laughs> And then the first question asked of you is, do you love me? Do you love me with this high-level agape love? I think that makes Peter pause. I think Peter is a different Peter now. He's a humbled Peter. This isn't the earlier sanguine Peter. Remember the Peter that would just jump at everything, right? He was the, the Peter at the Last Supper. At the Last Supper, just a few hours before he denies Jesus. He says, Jesus, I'll go anywhere with you. I'll go to prison with you. I'll die with you. And then he denies him three times. This is a different Peter who doesn't overestimate his abilities. This is a Peter that is not overconfident. This is a Peter that it has more honesty, more self-awareness. 
And he comes back and he says, Lord, you know that I love you. But if you look at the Greek, what's fascinating is that the, the, the presentation of this scene has Peter saying, I love you with the word filio, filia love, that ordinary human affection. Fine, good, but far from perfect. He's basically saying, Lord, you of all people know, you of all people know how incapable I am of this perfect, total, self-giving love. You know how I denied you. And so this is an honest, humble moment for Peter. And then Jesus comes right back and asks the second time, do you love me with, philia, with, with agape love? And, and Peter's like, oh, why are you asking again? No, Lord, you know that the best I can give you is philia love. And finally, the third time Jesus asks the question, he changes the word. He changes the word for love. He doesn't change the standard, but he's going to come down and meet Peter where he's at. And he says, do you love me with philia love? So he's willing to take whatever Peter can give. And then Peter comes back and says, Lord, you know everything. You of all people know how incapable I am of agape love. You of all people know the best I can give you is this weak, imperfect philia love. Now, why am I telling you this story? Because What's most amazing about this story and about what we can learn about discipleship, especially discipleship in the desert, is what happens next. The next part of the story is the most amazing part of the story. Once Peter comes to Jesus as he really is, not as he'd like to be, not as he hopes to be, but as he really is, weak, imperfect, with lots of faults, now Jesus can really begin to work with him and work in his soul. He's going to take Peter's weak, imperfect filia love and transform it with agape. How does he do that? He goes on, he tells Peter what's going to happen. He says, Peter, one day, he gives this prophecy, one day you will go where you do not want to go. You will be led where you do not want to be led. And when your arms are stretched out, what's he talking about? He's giving a prophecy about Peter's future martyrdom. Peter's future martyrdom in Rome when he's going to be crucified upside down in Nero's circus. One day, Peter will live this heroic, total self-giving love. But it all began right here on the shores of the Sea of Galilee. I think this is the most significant moment in Peter's life. This is what, what spiritual writers might describe as Peter's second conversion. He had that initial conversion early on when he was first called by Jesus. But now when it comes to a deeper awareness of his own inadequacy, and he comes before the Lord, the Lord can finally begin to work in him in a profound way. Peter is going to be changed. From this point on, you look at the story, Peter's a different man. The same Peter that denied Jesus three times Holy Thursday night. The, all of a sudden, you're going to see him in the next couple of scenes in Acts of the Apostles, leading the apostles. Who's the successor for Judas? The Holy Spirit comes. He proclaims the gospel. The 3,000 people, they're baptized all in a single day. He goes to prison as he wanted to early to, but now he really will go to prison multiple times, and he'll go all the way to Rome and be crucified. The great St. Peter, the rock upon which the church is built, our great hero apostle, it all began right here in this moment before Jesus, when he learned to come to Jesus as he really is. That's the heart of what I want to talk about today. Now, I, I, I want to share with you some, uh, something that's very dear to me. Uh, how many of you love religious art? Anyone love religious art? I love religion. I just got back from Rome, as I mentioned. I love being able to show people the beautiful art in the Vatican Museums and many of the churches. I'm going to share with you here one of my favorite pieces of art. Uh, this one is right up there with Caravaggio, Raphael, Michelangelo for me. It's this one here, if anyone can see. This was drawn by my little daughter, little Eleanor, drew this for me. <laughs> uh, so it's just a, just a bunch of scribbles, right? And, um, you know, if, if you know, I, I, she gives this picture to me. She gave this to me many years ago. And, and I ask her, what is this? She says, that's you, Daddy. <laughs> and I'm like... <laughs> What would you think of a dad that would just rip it up and tear it to shreds? <laughs> you know, don't you ever draw a picture for me until you get it exactly right. No, no, no good father would do that, right? 
As a dad, I see more than just my daughter's scribbles. I, I, see, I see her heart, that she's wanting to draw her daddy a present. She wants, wants to give her daddy a gift. I think our Heavenly Father looks at us the same way. So here's my question for you. Do you have areas of your life that you feel are a bunch of scribbles? Do you have areas of your life, maybe your prayer life, you feel like is just all over the place? You just don't know how to pray. Do you feel like your moral life, maybe you, you're struggling with a certain sin. You just keep bringing that same sin to confession for years, whether it's something about pride or impurity or the way you treat your spouse. Or maybe it's, maybe it's you, you fall into discouragement all the time, you know, the sin of discouragement, or you fall into uh, vanity. You compare yourselves to others. You just keep having the same weakness, and you feel like, I'm just not making progress. It's just a bunch of scribbles. Or maybe a, a certain r- friendship you have, a relationship with one of your kids. It, it didn't go well. And, and y- if you had to do it all over again, you'd do things differently, and you feel like it's just a bunch of scribbles. What do you do when you have your Peter moment? We're going to talk about that because it's in the desert of our lives, the desert of our spiritual lives, our moral lives, our relationships. It's in the desert that God wants to meet us and, and can transform us in the most profound ways in discipleship if we, if we let him. But before we get to all that, I just want to highlight, though, that the Father sees more than just your scribbled lines. He sees your heart. He sees your good intention. And, and, and he'll meet you there, and then he can transform your scribbled lines of your life into a beautiful masterpiece if you dare to meet him in the desert. So that's what we're going to talk about in, uh, in this presentation here this morning. On this, on this day, let's begin by turning to Our Lady. We will go through Mary to Jesus, uh, asking her to intercede for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You know, there's been a lot of talk about discipleship over the last five, seven years or so. Uh, you're, you're hearing it a, a lot from our Holy Father, Pope Francis. His first major document was all on the idea of being a missionary disciple. That created a lot of buzz, a lot of conversation about being a disciple. But it wasn't just him. It was emphasized by Pope Benedict, emphasized by John Paul II. You're seeing many dioceses setting up committees about discipleship. How do we build discipleship in our diocese? Many parishes forming committees and teams thinking, hey, how do we do discipleship? We're going to do discipleship. So lots of talks about discipleship these days. You can go online, type discipleship, you'll find seven keys to be a highly effective disciple, or here's five ways to do discipleship in the parish. And I love all the enthusiasm, all the creativity. I think this is a crucial theme for our church in these days. But I'm concerned that all this talk about discipleship is more just talk and not grounded in the Word of God. Is not grounded in Scripture and what God's inspired word in Scripture teaches about discipleship and, and what the tradition in our Catholic faith has told us about discipleship and what we find in the magisterial teachings about discipleship. So what I want to share with you today, I want to be very clear on this, we talk about discipleship all the time in focus. We've been doing this for 23 years, but what I'm going to share with you is not Edward Sree's ideas about discipleship or Curtis Martin or focus or anything else. What I'm going to share with you is this is just from God's inspired word. This is from the tradition. And if I had to pick one key word, one key word that sums up the heart of discipleship, it would be this word right here, imitation. Imitation. The disciple imitates the rabbi. Let's talk about this for a little bit. So what is a disciple? The word disciple in Greek, methete, means teach or a student or learner, but I don't want you to think of like a student at Ohio State, you know, sitting in a big lecture hall, thousand people in the lecture hall, and there's the professor up on the stage, and the disciple student is taking a bunch of notes. You don't have much of a relationship with your professor. You just have to do well on the exam at the end of the semester and get a good grade. That's not biblical discipleship. So don't think of professor-student relationship today. That's not the kind of student we're talking about. A disciple 
was someone who had a teacher, a rabbi, but they didn't just show up for class and take notes. They shared life with the rabbi. They lived with the rabbi. They shared meals with the rabbi. They prayed with the rabbi. They, they studied with the rabbi. They served the poor and the suffering with the rabbi. And the goal was imitation. The goal wasn't just to memorize the rabbi's teaching. That was a key part. Don't get me wrong. There was a lot of memorization going on. But the ultimate goal was to imitate the master's whole way of life. So you're watching the way he prays. You're watching the way he debates other rabbis. You're watching the way he lives. And, and, and it was his whole way of life that was meant to rub off on you. And you're were, you were, you were called to, 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 to live the life that he was modeling for you. I think about what Jesus himself says. Jesus in chapter 6, verse 40 of, of Luke's gospel, says that when a disciple is fully trained, he becomes like the rabbi himself. He becomes like the rabbi himself. That's the goal. If you're truly trained as a disciple, you become like the rabbi. So just, my friends, right now, just imagine being one of those disciples. Imagine being Philip or Andrew, James, John. You're one of those disciples. What are you doing? You didn't just show up for class with Jesus. When Jesus called people, what did he do? When he, when he sees Matthew in the tax collector's office, does he go, hey, Matthew, hey, go, go sign up for classes at the synagogue with me. Take on Monday, Wednesday, Friday at 11 a.m., you know, take my class. So what he did, he said, come, follow me. When he sees Peter and John on the shores of the Sea of Galilee and they're, and they're fishing, what does he say to him? He said, hey, John, Go meet me up on that mountain tomorrow at 3 p.m. I'm going to give this amazing sermon on the mountain there and, and bring a notebook, take a lot of good notes. I'm sure they were all taking good mental notes. Maybe some were even writing things down. But, but the, the key thing is, that's not what they did. It wasn't just simply show up for class. It was follow me. So imagine being one of those apostles for three years. Jesus is taking you basically on a three-year camping trip. Have you ever gone camping with someone? You really get to know people when you go camping with them. <laughs> but for three years, you're with Jesus, zigzagging around Galilee, crossing the sea, all going all over, and you're watching Jesus every morning pray. You're watching all that he does, and his way of life is meant to rub off on you. So while Jesus taught many things, and surely you're going to remember his teachings, you remember people's actions even more, don't you? Actions speak louder than words. And so while Jesus talked about praying, prayer is important, every day you're watching Jesus get up early and go to a lonely place to go pray. And you start noticing that, like, that's really important. Jesus talked about being light to the world, going out to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But then you watch Jesus himself constantly going to the sick, to the suffering, to those that were lepers, to those that are outcasts, always going to the peripheries. You're watching Jesus have this urgent, pressing need to go to the lost. And that, that would inspire you. You, you watch Jesus. He, he talked about forgiving, for, you know, forgiving and loving your enemies. But if you were St. John and you were there on Good Friday and you watch Jesus as he's being nailed to the cross say, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. That's going to leave much more of an impression than the lecture he gave on forgiveness. It's the whole way of life. It's like parenting. Being a parent, we got lots of parents here, right? It's such a daunting task being a parent, you know, especially when they're older and they're teenagers and they're smart. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and they notice your weaknesses more, <laughs> you know? Like, they imitate you. Like, I can teach my kids all about patience and kindness and service, but they're going to learn all of that by watching mom and dad and how they're patient with each other and, and how they are, are serving and how they're kind. That's where they're going to learn about it. Like, I remember a couple years ago, I was getting frustrated with my kids, and I was just like, would you stop getting mad at your little brother? And I'm like, whoa, well, why are they getting mad at your little brother? Because they're watching dad lose his temper right now. <laughs> you know, so they imitate us for better or for worse. Uh, but imitation, that's where you learn the art of living. You learn the art of the virtues by imitating others. And we are disciples of Jesus. Our rabbi is Jesus Christ. And we're called to imitate him and his virtues. There was a great rabbinic saying that said this, that said, if you, if you find a good rabbi, cover yourself in the dust of the rabbi. 
Isn't that beautiful image? So you can picture like a rabbi might be walking through the town and there'd be you know, the line of disciples behind him walking very closely. The idea is you want to walk closely to the rabbi. If you walk close to the rabbi, the dust from his sandals may pick up and start to cover your garments. But it was a beautiful image to describe you want the dust of the rabbi's way of life to cover you. We want the life of Jesus, his love, his patience, his generosity, his kindness, his sacrifice. We want his whole way of life to cover us. It's all about imitation. That's why St. Paul, St. Paul, when he is writing to his disciples in Corinth, what does he tell them? He says, memorize all my teaching. He emphasizes that in his letter to the Corinthians. But he also says, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. The art of discipleship is all about imitation. It's about imitating our master, Jesus. Now, I'm going to switch gears on you. So we've talked about Rome. We've talked about the Sea of Galilee and the Holy Land. I'm going to take you on a world tour. We're going to go somewhere else now. Has anyone ever been to London? Anyone been to London here? Okay, in London, it's fascinating. If you, did you go on the subway, the, the tube? the underground, you go into the subway system in London and you go down there and you see these three words everywhere. They're on the walls, they're on the platform, on the ground, you hear them in the speakers and audio voice saying these same three words over and over again. I, I don't understand it. Uh, I, I've been on subway systems all around the world. Here in the United States, I've been in Rome, I've been in Paris, I've been in Bangkok, and I don't see these three words all over the place. There's something about England where they're really nervous. And what is it? Mind the gap. Why are they worried about mind the gap? What is it? Well, because there's this gap between where you are on the platform and where the train is. And they're worried if you don't mind the gap, what might happen? You might fall. <laughs> so you have to mind the gap. My question for you is, do you mind the gap, the gaps that you have in your life? Do you mind the gaps you have in your relationship with God? Let's start there. Do you mind the gaps in your prayer life? Like, do you, do you pray consistently every day? Every day, no matter what? Or do you pray when it's convenient, when it fits in your schedule, when you like to pray? Are you, do you fail in consistency in prayer? Do, do, do you mind the gap? Or maybe you just read things in prayer. You turn your holy hour into study hall and you just read things. You're not, you don't take time to listen to God and allow him to speak to you. You're doing all the talking. You know, do you, are you aware of those gaps in your friendship with God in prayer and are, are you working on it? How about your gaps in your marriage? Are you aware of the ways that you fall short as a husband? Are you aware of the ways that maybe you, you, you need to love your, your wife better? And be more thoughtful of what she needs and what she's going through. Are you aware of the gaps that you have in your marriage? And are you doing something to try to bridge those gaps? Are you aware of the gaps you have with your children? Maybe there's a certain child you have a, a strained relationship with. Maybe a certain child needs more of your time, more of your attention. Are you aware of those gaps and are you working on it? A Christian disciple is constantly thinking about the gaps that they have in their lives. You see, there's two basic questions every disciple asks. If you're a true disciple, you're not just a Catholic going through the motions. You're not just a Catholic that shows up at church on Sundays, throws money in the basket, volunteers every once in a while. You're not just an Orthodox Catholic that stands up for all the truths. But what's happening on the inside? How do I know I'm really growing in holiness? How do I know I'm growing as a disciple, growing in my friendship with Christ? How do I know that? I mean, wouldn't it be really cool if there was a holiness thermometer? I mean, you could just check in every morning and go, oh, good, I grew in 14 degrees of holiness last week. Awesome. You know, it'd be really awesome if there was something like that. The key is imitation. Ask yourself, don't ask yourself, did I, did, did, do I listen to Catholic radio? Do I watch EWTN? Do I do Catholic things in my parish? All that, by the way, is awesome. It can enrich that friendship with Christ. But that's not the mark of our true identity as a disciple. If you're a disciple, you're minding the gap in your life. If you're a disciple, you're thinking about these two crucial questions. Are you ready? Here's the first one. First question, what am I made for? What am I made for? I am made for transformation in Jesus Christ. I'm made to be transformed, to, 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 be, to be clothed with his life, to put on Christ, as St. Paul said. 
to think like him. John Paul II describes discipleship as someone who thinks like Christ, loves like Christ, serves like Christ. I'm taking on Christ's qualities. That's what I'm made for. Jesus himself says that we're called to be perfect as our heavenly Father is perfect. That's what we're made for. Now here's my question. How many of you have reached this stage of perfection? Anyone here? Because if you did, I want to meet you. That means you're a saint. (laughs) And if I touch you, I can become a second-class relic. And that'd be really cool. (laughs) We're made for perfection in Jesus Christ, but none of us are there. That's why we have to ask the second question, the truth about myself. Where am I right now? So here I am. This is Edwards III here in 2021. And I've got some good qualities. I sincerely, I really do love Jesus. My faith is, is very important to me. And, I, I, and my, I love my wife. I love my kids. I love my friends. I love my colleagues. I love the students I teach. I love the people I serve. I really do. But I also know that that love is tainted by selfishness, by pride, by many sins, many weaknesses, many hurts from my past. There's things that just get in the way from me loving like Christ loves, allowing Christ to to transform me. So I have a lot of good qualities. I have a lot of things I need to work on, a lot of gaps. This is where I am right now. This is the truth about who I am. This is what I'm made for. I'm made to be transformed in Jesus Christ. How do I get from A to B? How do I get from where I am right now to where Christ wants me to be? That, my friends, is the journey of discipleship. This is what discipleship is all about. It's about being transformed, or as St. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 3.18, it's about being changed into his likeness from one degree of glory to another. We long for that change. We long for that transformation. We want to share in Christ's likeness. How do we do this? Being aware of our gaps is the first step. And I want to press this issue with all of you just a little bit here. Because one thing that we see sometimes in our, our, our crazy modern world where we live in such a secular culture, and you look all around and you're just saying, well, I mean, everything's falling apart. We don't get anything right. We don't even get bathrooms right. How are we going to figure anything out in this society? And we could get really discouraged, but we can also kind of pat ourselves on the back and say, well, I believe in God. I mean, a lot of Americans don't believe in God. I believe in God. I don't just believe in God. I go to church every Sunday. Wow, I'm in the 90th percentile now. I even go on the holy days. Okay, 93rd percentile. You know, I volunteer at my parish, 93 four percentile. You know, I do all these Catholic things. I watch these Catholic videos. I listen to these Catholic podcasts. I, li- I watch Catholic TV. I listen to Catholic radio. 95th percentile. I'm doing really good. I, and I'm generous. I give money to my church. 96th percentile. I stand up for all of the truths of the Catholic church. I stand up for all those tough teachings on human life about abortion. I stand up for the definition of marriage. I stand up for, for, for belief in Genesis 1:27 that God made us male and female. Man, I'm 99th percentile right now. I'm doing really good. And don't get me wrong, it's quite heroic to do all those things in the kind of culture that we're living in. I just want you to know all of that's essential, but it doesn't make you a disciple in and of itself. The bigger question is what's happening on the inside. Anyone watching Olympics right now? I've been watching a lot of Olympics. Imagine if I told you, you know, I should be on that Olympic basketball team. Really, I should. Because I'm really, really good at basketball. I can't believe the, the U.S. Olympic Committee didn't choose me. I said, wow, Dr. Shri, we didn't know that about you. I said, yeah, I'm really, really good. And you say, well, what, what makes you so good? He says, I'm, I'm really, really good at following all the rules. I'm amazing. I don't go out of bounds. I don't double dribble. I don't travel with the basketball. I mean, really, the U.S. needs me. (laughs) Yeah, you all are laughing at me and mocking me, as you should, because you know that simply following the rules doesn't make you a great basketball player. It's essential, right? But it's just the the starting point. It's just permission to play. The same is true in our walk with Jesus. Simply following the rules is not enough. It's essential, absolutely. We should be willing to die for the truths of our Catholic faith. But that's just permission to play. 
the real question, if I want to be a great basketball player, do I have the skills of being a great basketball player? Do I know how to shoot? Do I know how to block out? Do I know how to pass, dribble, all those things? Same thing in the Christian life. Do I imitate Jesus Christ? That's the essence of discipleship. And this whole biblical language of discipleship is so Catholic. This is just the way that the saints have viewed our Catholic life. What book did St. Therese read the most? Any, any little flower fans out there? What, what, was, what was the book she turned to over and over again? It's, it's the second most famous book in the world. The Bible's the most read book. What's the number two book? The what? The what of Christ? Ah, imitation. Right? The great spiritual classic. It's all about imitating Jesus. Are you seeking to not just be an Orthodox Catholic? A Catholic that does the right things, says the right things, believes the right things, all of that absolutely essential. But is there something more going on in your heart? Are you really striving to imitate Jesus in your prayer life, in your life, in your marriage, with your children, with your coworkers, in your parish? Are we taking on the imitation of Christ? Okay, now let's get to the heart of discipleship here. I want to talk about how do I experience this transformation? If I want to experience this change, what do I need to do? The first thing is, uh, am I striving to imitate Christ? That's the key. Do I really have that going on? And one thing you find is that whether, maybe I bet many of you had conversions, you know, a long time ago. Maybe it was in your high school. Maybe it was when you were in college. Maybe it was when you first got married or you first started having kids. Some of you, it's been in recent years. Maybe some people just entered the church recently as well. But whenever you have that lights-on experience and like all of a sudden you just everything changes and you just want to follow Jesus and you want to just start growing in holiness and imitating him, what do you find? you find that the Christian way is really, really easy. No. <laughs> you find how hard it is, how difficult it is to follow Christ. It's kind of like, you know, my kids, when we go to the mall, this always happens. I don't know why this happens, but it's the craziest thing. So we go to the mall, and then all of a sudden, one of the kids sees it, and they just take off, and they start running toward it. And then the second kid notices the older brother running. And then the, so then they start running. Then the third one, they all start running. And what is it that they see? The escalators. They love the escalators. Uh, and, and my kids are so fascinated with the escalators. Which escalator do they want to go up? They want to go up the downward escalator. They think it's so fun to go up the downward escalator. I'm like, oh, no, you're embarrassing the street family. Would you please stop? You know? So they're going up the downward escalator. Now, if you're going up a downward escalator, it takes extra time, extra effort, because the whole thing is pulling you down. <laughs> If you're just sitting there coasting, what's going to happen? You're just going to go down. And so when you're living in just a secular world or just a mediocre Christian, you're just kind of coasting in life. You're not having to battle against anything. You're just going along with the culture. You're going along with your own weakness, your own passions, and it's just taking you down. But once all of a sudden you get that lights on conversion, I want to follow Jesus, you know, and then you have to, it takes a little extra effort, and it can be hard. <laughs> I think about my daughter, Josephine. Uh, she's older now, but when she was five, I remember we left her with uh, some babysitters. And uh, the, we came back after our evening out and asked her how things were going. She says, oh, you know, there are a bunch of different families coming all together, and there were all these kids playing. And we said, how was Josephine doing? And, and the babysitter said, oh, there was an interesting moment. Uh, they were all kind of dogpiling on each other, and then Josephine jumped on top of the dog pile, And all I said was just simply, oh, Josephine, be careful that the babysitter is telling us the story. And, and then Josephine jumps out of the dog pile really quick. He goes, okay, and looked really scared. And the babysitter said, is everything okay, Josephine? And Josephine says, I've been trying to be good. And then the babysitter says, how's that been going for you, Josephine? <laughs> and Josephine almost breaks out in tears. It's really hard. <laughs> It's true not just for little kids, but even us adult children of God, it's hard to be good. It's hard to go up against that downward escalator, isn't it? Uh, and so when we strive to imitate Christ, we come to realize that the Nike approach to spirituality, the Nike approach simply will not work. Remember Nike's slogan, just do it? Sometimes I think we think, I can just do it. And that's simply not the case. So what do we do, though? What do we do when we hit those moments when we're like Peter and we've, we run up against our own weakness, 
Or we feel like little Josephine. I'm trying to be good, but we can't. What happens then? Whoops, I'm going to go forward here. This is my little daughter, Eleanor. That, that's a couple years ago. She's, she's a little bigger now. Um, but I'll tell the fun story. Have you ever seen a kid take their first step? Yeah, it's really fun when they take their first step. Have you ever seen a kid, though, I think even more exciting than the first step is their first jump? Have you ever seen a kid take the first jump? Learning to jump is hilarious. It's just so funny because it's so, it, how do you teach someone to jump? So she's like a little over one, and, and, and I remember all the older siblings had her in the living room. They made a big circle around her. They're trying to teach her how to jump, and they're all jumping, and Eleanor's just sitting there going like this, <laughs> not knowing how to do this thing. And they say, okay, Eleanor, ready? Bend your knees. And I said, bend your knees. Okay, ready? Now, three, two, one, jump. And then they all jump, and then she just goes like this. <laughs> No takeoff. <laughs> and they're laughing, and she's laughing. And, uh, and the kids, okay, can try again, ready? Bend your knees, and then push off the ground. Push off the ground, ready? Okay, three, two, one, jump. And they all jump, and then it goes, fail takeoff a second time. Uh, and she's laughing again, and, and they just they keep trying. But after about seven or eight failed takeoffs, Eleanor was not laughing anymore. She was getting frustrated. She was just, just not wanting to do it anymore. And so she just walked away. And she's like, no jump, no jump. <laughs> Doesn't want to try. Do you ever feel that way in your life? Where there's certain parts of your life that just aren't taking off like you hope? Like maybe your prayer life isn't taking off. Maybe your marriage didn't take off the way you hoped. The way you, uh, parenting your children maybe didn't take off or something something big you were planning in the parish and really hoping this would, this would just revolutionize the parish and it just didn't take off. Do you ever have those moments where you feel like it just isn't working? And when you face that, you, 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 you can be tempted like Eleanor to get discouraged. You get tempted like Eleanor to get discouraged and to, to think that you just, it's just not going to work. And you'll be tempted to give up. This is the most important moment in discipleship. I mean, there's the foundational moment of when we're first called. But when we run up against our weakness, our limitations as disciples, when we're striving to imitate Christ and we realize we can't, what do we do in those moments? That's how Peter felt on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. This is how Eleanor felt in jumping. What do we do in these moments? I want to share with you an insight from one of my favorite saints, St. Saint Therese, of Lisieux. She wrote to her sister, uh, they, were, they were exchanging letters, and the sister was describing how she just felt f frustrated with her own weakness. The sister was saying, you know, I've got all these weaknesses, all these gaps. She didn't use the word gaps, but that idea here. A and it feels like a mountain I have to climb. Like there's just this mountain of weakness that I have to, to overcome. And Therese writes back and says, you're trying to scale the mountain of sanctity, but God wants to meet you down low in the valley of humility. You're trying to scale up to God and, and scale this mountain to overcome all your weakness to meet God up there, but God wa doesn't want to meet you up there. God wants to meet you down here in the fertile valley of humility, she says. It's a beautiful line. I love this image. Because I think that's, that's where many of us are at, that we, we, we can come to recognize, yep, I've got these gaps, I've got these weaknesses, then what do I do? I, and and I, I just can't overcome them, I'm not changing, it's not, it's, not, it's not being fixed, and we can be discouraged. Why am I not taking off? But the lesson we want to learn from the saints, and what Therese describes so beautifully here, is that God doesn't want to meet us up here in this imaginary, ideal vision we have for our lives that I should be the perfect Catholic man, this perfect Catholic husband, this perfect Catholic father, I should be this. Now, I am called to perfection, but I have to face the reality that that's just not where I'm at. And God doesn't want to meet me up here. Why? Because I'm not there. And the same is for you. God doesn't want to meet you way up here because you're not there right now. God wants to meet the real you, where you are right now, as you are right now, not where you'd like to be someday, not the ideal image you have for yourself, 
Not the image you post on social media, not the image you have of your family and for your Christmas picture where everyone looks perfect. No, no, that's not the real you. God wants to meet the real you with all of your insecurities, with all of your weaknesses, all of your addictions, all of your sins, all of your hurts, the wounds that you're carrying. That's the real you. Do you allow Jesus to meet the real you as you really are? Peter wasn't posing in John's gospel there on the shores of the Sea of Galilee. He came as he really was. Lord, you know how incapable I am. Do you come to Jesus as you are and dare to meet him in the valley of humility? When we can come to him, broken as we are, and allow him to enter in, that's when we experience the deeper transformation where he begins to heal the roots of our sins. He heals the roots of our, our weaknesses and imperfections. That's where the real transformation takes place. And so what we want to do is realize that, yes, we should be striving to imitate Christ. Discipleship involves this intense upward movement. I'm going to give everything to follow Jesus. But in the end, we realize, as Therese says, that's only so much. And we're going to fall short. And we have to come and allow God to come down and meet us in the valley of humility. And it's there that we experienced how loved we are, not for what we do, not for how much we give, not for how much time we spend in the chapel, not for how many decades of the rosary pray. All of those things are good. They enrich our spiritual life. But we are loved simply for the sake of who we are as beloved sons and daughters. And Jesus wants us to know that fundamental point so profoundly at the core of our being do we know how loved we really are by God. It's a love that we cannot earn. Love cannot be earned. You can't earn the love of a parent. You cannot earn the love of a coach a teacher, a boss, and you certainly cannot earn the love of God. It has to be received. Love can't be earned. It has to be received. And it's received most profoundly in those moments like Peter, in those moments when we're in the valley of humility and we allow God in our weakness to love us. And it's there that we experience how much we are forgiven that Jesus, no matter what we've done, no matter how many times we've done it, no matter how many times we fall, every time we turn to him, especially in the sacrament of reconciliation, we go into that confessional and we experience this free, total love, this forgiveness, and it's there that then we begin to be healed and transformed. Now, I want to tell you about, again, I'm going to tell you about my, my favorite saint here, Therese. Do you know about Therese's conversion story? Do you all know about Therese's conversion story? I love the story of Therese and her conversion. Did you know Therese used to play in a punk rock band and did drugs and found Jesus? No, that's not what happened. <laughs> Therese was not a Protestant minister who became Catholic. <laughs> but, but Therese, her, her conversion story would never become a Lighthouse Catholic CD. You know, although I think it should because it's a beautiful conversion story that we can all relate to. It's, it's a story about the ordinary types of miracles God wants to work in all our lives. Here's her story. So when she was very young, about four and a half, her, her mother died. Before her mother died, she was outgoing, confident, joyful. She was really close to her mom, but then her mom died, and that all changed. She became very insecure, timid, and she really struggled in controlling her emotions. And, and she was very pious and spiritual, and she knew that this was a weakness, even from a young age, and she's constantly trying to work on this idea of controlling her emotions, but every little, the littlest thing would set her off. Somebody says something, she did something wrong, and she feels bad about it, and she would just start crying. She couldn't control her emotions, and then she felt bad about the fact that she couldn't control her emotions, so she would cry for having cried about her weakness. You know, so it was a real problem. This is continuing all the way until her teen, early teenage years. She's 14 years old, and she's still struggling with this. And one day, it's Christmas Eve, and she, she goes to Mass with her, her family for the Christmas Midnight Mass. And if you've ever done Midnight Mass with your kids, anyone ever done that? Do you, do, are you a little grumpy after midnight mass? It's supposed to be Christmas, but you're just exhausted, and the kids have wiped you out, and you know. So, so anyway, the the father comes home, and he's in well, a little grumpy mood. I can I, I can understand, and and um and there's this tradition they have in France of putting the shoes out on Christmas Eve for the little children, uh, and and then you put and then you put the the the, the presents in, into the shoe, and and the, and the father comes home and sees that Therese put the shoes out, 
and Therese is going up the stairs. She's going upstairs. Oh, no, no, Therese is coming downstairs, and her sister Celine is going up the stairs, and they both overhear the father out loud grumbling and complaining about the shoes. The father's saying, oh, she's 14 years old. Does she really need this? Well, at least this will be the last year. So Therese hears dad complaining about the shoes. What would Therese normally do? Cry, break down in tears. And Celine sees this and sees that Therese's eyes are welling up with tears. And Celine's like, wait, wait, don't go downstairs. No, no, don't, don't ruin Christmas. Just, just stay up here. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, Therese finds this inner strength, holds back the tears, goes downstairs, sees the shoes, opens it up and just is joyful and then jumps in her father's arms, says, thank you, Daddy, for the presence. The dad is like, sees the excitement of the daughter and he's happy again. And Celine is like, did that just happen? <laughs> Therese normally would totally break down at this moment. Now, Therese describes this as her conversion moment. She describes this as the Christmas miracle, the miracle of God's grace in her life. Now, some of you are wondering, What's so miraculous about that? Those of us who've raised teenage daughters know when a teenage girl learns how to control her emotions, that is pretty miraculous. I was gonna <laughs> but for all of us, we should see that what was going on in Therese, this is the miracles, the ordinary miracles that, work, that God works in ordinary people's lives. That when we're struggling with someone, she battled for, four t for 10 years, struggling against this weakness bringing it to confession, making sacrifices, and then one day, God's grace works in profound ways. And she was, from that point forward, changed. That should give all of us hope. Because maybe we don't struggle with that kind of thing, struggling with tears. Maybe we struggle with anger. Or maybe we struggle with lustful glances. Maybe we struggle with pride and always thinking we're right. Maybe we struggle with with uh, selfishness. I always want to do what I want. Whatever we struggle with, we've got these weaknesses. God can come in and transform us if we dare to meet him in the valley of humility. Let me read this quote from Therese. She says, We must do everything in our power. Give without counting the cost. Practice virtue at every opportunity. Deny ourselves constantly. Prove our love by all kinds of attentions and marks of affection. In a word, do all good deeds in our power for the love of God. That's that upward movement of discipleship. But then listen to the next sentence. But since all that is really very little, it's important to place all our trust in him alone who sanctifies all deeds and can sanctify without them. That is what the little way of childhood is all about. Yes, we should give everything, but in the end we're going to realize how much we fall short and when we do, we allow God to encounter us in the valley of humility. We allow him to meet us in our Peter moments, our little Eleanor moments, allow him to meet us and experience his love, his forgiveness, and his transformation. Now, if I had more time, I, uh, and I know I, that, that was a dangerous line, Scott says, that's always dangerous when a speaker says that, but I'll just throw this on the board. There's four key things that you need for your life if you want to experience this transformation. I'm not going to have time to go through it. I cover it in the book that I wrote, they have in the bookstore here. It's, it's called Into His Likeness. Just the title of this, Be Transformed as a Disciple. Um, the four key habits of a disciple, these aren't, again, th just four random things. This is what the earliest disciples dedicated themselves to after Pentecost. This is what the early church turned to uh, for centuries. Whenever the Catholic Church summarized what is the Catholic faith all about, it turned to these four things. In our modern era, we have a book that summarizes the Catholic faith. What's it called? How many sections of the catechism are there? Four, four pillars. Where did those four pillars come from? Acts 2.42. So what I'm sharing with you, again, I want to be really clear, this is from the heart of the church. This is what the church is saying we need. And I, I like to think of these as four encounter moments. These are different ways that we encounter God. First one is in prayer. I'm going to talk about that more in, our, in my workshop this afternoon. But you all know the need for daily prayer. Not just saying prayers, but encountering Jesus every day. Being faithful to prayer is more important than any feelings you get from prayer. More important than praying when you, are, you know, it fits into your schedule. But being faithful every day is an act of love. And we encounter Jesus when we're faithful to daily prayer. 
Secondly, the, the sacraments. Acts 2.42 describes this as the breaking of the bread, which is the Eucharist, the center of all the sacraments. We need to have a sacramental life, receiving the Eucharist regularly, going to the visit, make visits to the Blessed Sacrament, going to confession regularly. Every true disciple should go to confession at least, at least once a month. If there's anyone here that doesn't have enough sin in one month's time to bring to confession, again, I want to meet you. Come to me. <laughs> let's, 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 let's talk because you're a saintly person. Uh, but we all have to keep going regularly to not just be forgiven, but in, in the sacrament of reconciliation, we receive grace to overcome our weaknesses. The, the next habit is fellowship. And the church has always seen the importance of having good friends, other brothers and sisters that we are running with us. Uh, people that support us in our faith life and also encountering Jesus in the poor, in the suffering. So the works of mercy were also often put into this third category of the habit of a disciple. And finally, the apostles' teachings. This is so important right now because so many of the, the issues that we're facing in our culture are, are intellectual issues. What is a human person? What makes us happy? What is love? Uh, what does it mean to be a man? What does it mean to be a woman? There's all these intellectual challenges that we face today, and we have to form our mind regularly with the truths of the faith and not just take in what Netflix and YouTube and Instagram is feeding us all the time. We have to really form our minds because there's a battle going on for your mind. The culture wants you to think a certain way. And if you're not careful about your diet of what you're taking in in social media and what you're taking in with music, what you're taking in and what you're taking from Hollywood on screens, all those things, you will be led away by, by the culture. We have to fill our minds with the teachings of the apostles, the teachings of our Catholic faith. So those are the four habits of the disciple. I wish I had more time to get into those, but those are a little more straightforward. You can read more about them uh, in the book I wrote here called Into His Likeness. Let's close with a glory be. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Glory be.